There is a hierarchy of ways to access and store data in a computer system. The cheapest, slowest way to store and retrieve data is disk. On the faster end, we have memory. As we architect systems with increasing complexity, we have additional considerations for these different layers of ways to access and store data. There's network latency, there's transient compute nodes, there's numerous caching layers. Apache Geode is a distributed in-memory system for the JVM. It provides fast data storage and retrieval. Swapnil Bawaskar is an engineer who works on Geode, and he joins the show today to explain the architecture of Geode and how Geode is different from other in-memory systems that get used for caching, such as Memcached or Redis. I hope you enjoyed this episode. It's a great distributed systems dive into a application that's been around for a while but has been open sourced more recently. And Swapnil is a great explainer. So with that, let's get to this episode. Geode with Swapnil Bawaskar. The Insight Data Engineering program helps software engineers level up their careers. Data engineering is at the cutting edge of how we build software, and it involves some of the most interesting open source and distributed technologies, such as Apache Spark, Kafka, and NoSQL databases. Insight Data Engineering is free because they partner with top companies like Facebook, Uber, Capital One, and Slack. You can learn about data engineering at Insight Data Engineering. And if you go to insightdataengineering.com slash sedaily, you can apply. Listeners of this show will be advanced straight to the coding challenge of the application process. If you get accepted, you get to learn how to build useful products in a self-directed program. There are workspaces in New York and Palo Alto that you can utilize during the short seven-week data engineering training process, and you have access to free cloud computing resources and a network of over 600 data engineers and data scientists from over 100 companies. Insight provides this support until you find a great data engineering position at a top company. Apply now at insightdataengineering.com slash sedaily. Skip straight to the coding challenge. This is a special offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners. Thanks to Insight Data Engineering. And if you want to level up your career, if you want to learn some new skills and change what you are working on in your work environment, and perhaps get a job upgrade if you're looking for a different type of job, or if you're between academia and your career path and you want to build a little more skill before you jump on that career path, learn about data engineering at Insight Data Engineering. Go to insightdataengineering.com slash sedaily to apply and skip straight to that coding challenge. And thanks again to Insight Data Engineering for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. You can also check out the interview I did with Insight Data Engineering several months ago on Software Engineering Daily. Let's get back to this episode. Swapnil Bawaskar is a distributed systems engineer with Pivotal. Swapnil, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm a regular listener of the show and glad to be on. So Apache Geode is what we're talking about today. And I think the best way to get started with this is to give some historical context on where Geode sits. So in computer science, there is this hierarchy of ways to access and store data. And... The cheapest and slowest way to store data is typically on disk, and or unless you want to talk about like tape or something. But uh, on the faster end, you have memory. And for listeners who are newer to this area, can you give us a brief refresh on the idea of the memory hierarchy? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, well, um, when 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 I studied um, the memory hierarchy, you know, uh, back in school, um, it was represented as a pyramid. So um, assume that uh, the CPU actually sits at the top of the pyramid. And so, um, you know, um, the, the fastest uh, memory that the CPU can access is uh, the CPU registers. Um, and then the CPU also has this cache, um, 
you know on on the chip itself so there's a, a l1 cache and l2 cache and so on which tends to be a few kilobytes um followed by the main memory um and so the access times here uh, uh tend to be around um, 100 uh, microseconds um so after that comes the disk um and and that typically is around 10 milliseconds so it's a order of magnitude uh, difference and then the base of the pyramid is obviously uh, you know the the tape drives that <laughs> that you refer to right exactly so you know i remember uh, learning about the memory hierarchy in um, computer science classes, and it's funny because it, you know, we were learning about it in a single machine context, but the idea of geode and some other projects around distributed memory are pushing this idea of the memory hierarchy to a distributed system. Um, and so as we start to talk about distributed systems, the earliest big open source project around distributed systems management was Hadoop, I think. Is that is that right? Was it Hadoop? Well, early around big data, yeah. I, I think, yes, you, you can say that. So, so prob- probably Hadoop. I mean, Hadoop maybe was the first one to gain a lot of momentum. And as I understand, Hadoop was mostly is mostly about storing your data on disk. You store it in HDFS, which is the Hadoop file system. So it stores data in files on disk. Can you give us a a bit of a chronology on how we have moved from that era where we were storing everything on disk and then when we wanted to run a you know, some batch job, load load what we need into memory and then perform some operation on it. How have we moved from that to where we are now and um, move us towards the the idea of geode? So you know, it's it's no surprise that the prices of uh, uh, to anybody that the prices of memory are going down. You know, right? I, I think everybody is aware of that. So um, back in two thousand four, two thousand five, I bought this uh, five twelve MB RAM for my laptop for about seventy to eighty dollars, right? And I was just trying to look up the memory prices now, and you can buy um, sixteen GB RAM for like fifty dollars. So. Um, that has uh, been a very significant uh, change, um, and and that has been partly enabled by uh, the memory density. So, so this year, um, the memory density of RAM has first time exceeded the memory density of uh, the traditional hard disk drive, um, and that has you know um, um, uh, helped. Uh, RAM has been the uh, the main uh, storage story. Um, also, the cloud providers, right? So, uh, what uh, what has make made this even easier to access for everybody is these cloud providers providing humongous instances with huge amounts of RAM, and you can um, just spin one instance up. Uh, and <laughs> so, like Amazon, for example, has this uh, X1 instance type which has two terabytes of RAM. Yeah. So as we move towards the discussion of the application um, beyond the fundamentals that are pushing us in this direction, fundamentals like price and cloud computing, Apache Geode is this distributed memory-based data management platform. Explain what that means. So at its heart, um, Apache Geode is a distributed uh, hash map. Um, So uh, you know what the the hash map then has simple operations, right? It's just a get a put, um, and we also have these atomic operations um, like put if absent, remove, um, you know stuff like the Java concurrent hash map provides. So it's it implements that interface essentially, um, and then stores that data in a distributed system, and totally abstracting away how that is done done from from the from the client. Um, okay. And so, you know, when you're, st- you're storing data, so, you know, then you need to, uh, to be able to query it. So we have uh, a query engine called OQL, which, is, which stands for Object Query Language. Um, and, and we also have the ability to run, uh, you know, your application code within Geode cluster. So move execution close to where the data is um, rather than the other way around. Uh, rather than trying to pull the data in. So, you know, um, that uh, is typically, uh, so that is, you know, geode in a nutshell, I guess. Right. Yeah, and we'll talk more about the 
abstractions that Geode utilizes. Um, you know, as you mentioned, it's this big distributed hash map. We'll talk about what's new about that, but let's let's talk a little bit at the application level, the high level. Apache Geode was originally designed for the financial sector for low latency trading platforms, and I think it's fair to say that as our systems have evolved, our our other systems, you know, just just systems like social media websites and. Uh, maybe monitoring systems for any type of web application you have, our systems are looking more and more like the low latency trading platforms of the past. So um, perhaps this type of architecture is is pushing outwards. What purpose was Geode originally serving when it was a closed source application in the trading sector? Yes. So, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, um, Geode is now open source, right? But the project um, is new to open source world but the project itself has existed for a, a, a long period so essentially since 2002 i believe and um so our first and foremost uh, users were the finance industry and, and the memory has gotten cheaper now and and more accessible to everybody but and even when it was expensive uh, people on uh, wall street had deep enough pockets to to afford uh, doing in-memory com- computation. And that's where uh, we had uh, a wide adoption. Um, right. So the typical use cases uh, that you know the Wall Street people were uh, trying to solve with Geod is risk management, essentially. So that was the biggest use case that they had, uh, the ability to uh, run you know, their risk models uh, over large amounts of data very quickly in order to then uh, judge if you know they should go ahead and make a trade or not essentially absolutely and um, the whole algorithmic trading also uh, i think was in was in the pictures but i'm not really um uh, purview I, I don't really know how much geo played a part in that but i i assume it did because you know they also have this um, cloak of secrecy and you know not telling us exactly what they're <laughs> trying to use it for <laughs> um and the other uh, uh, important use case that they also did was uh, on the trading floor itself. Um, so, you know, you have this market data, right, coming in at huge volume, this ticker data. And then you have these traders sitting on their desks. Um, so one of the features that uh, Geo provides is this notion of a continuous query. So you just have this uh, query registered with the servers and whenever... Um, the uh, query results are satisfied, the clients get notified. Um, so, you know, um, uh, um, one of the examples that we tend to give is um, select star from trades uh, where the uh, ticker symbol is, say, Google and um, price greater than, say, $700, right? So you register that query with the, with the server and whenever uh, your ticker uh, meets that query criteria, you, uh, we send we send push notification out to the client. That is so fascinating that um, that was a pattern even back in. I mean, this was so Geode was first developed. What was it like eight years ago or ten years ago or something like that? Well, around fourteen years ago. Fourteen years ago. Well, it's funny because observables. I've done some shows recently about uh, observables and RxJS um, and RxJava. They're really catching a lot of steam these days, but it's just funny that this, you know, everything new is actually old. Um, you know, Geode was implementing this observable pattern where you can push based on, you know, changes in the data model. You, you know, you can push changes to subscribers. It was implementing that back in the day. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, uh, the funny thing I like to mention is, um, so... Um, um, our entire development team is based out of Portland, Oregon, and you know, just from <laughs> just being from Portland, right? We we like to do things before they are cool. <laughs> Portland is an edgy place. I've been there. Um, so let's okay. More generally, what is Geode useful for? Because we've got this idea that it's this distributed hash map. It's in the JVM, right? It only runs in the JVM, that's right, right? Okay, yeah. So it's just distributed hash map. It's got 
observability. So if something changes in the data model, it can push stuff to you. More generally, so what is this useful for more generally when we talk about applications, you know, like whether we're talking about a social network or a web app or... Um, so um, Geo can be used anytime you're having trouble scaling your uh, relational database to meet uh, your application needs. Um, so uh, a typical use case uh, we have seen is, uh, you know, uh, applications um, talking to Geo to just uh, do all your uh, CRUD operations um, as well as querying. And um, what Geo ends up doing is it patches up all your CRUD operations and then does a bulk update on your uh, relational database. So um, that's the uh, the typical use case that Geo has. Recently, we've also started uh, uh, seeing Geo being used to implement uh, the CQRS pattern. So um, CQRS stands for uh, Command Query Responsibility Segregation, and um, the uh, the idea here is to essentially uh, you know uh, have the ability to scale your reads as well as writes independently. Um, so what we've seen is, you know, uh, you, you would typically use a system like uh, a Kafka that uh, deals with uh, uh, all the events that are coming into your system. And, um, and then on the querying side, uh, you know, um, given that Geode has uh, these query semantics, as well as uh, uh, the continuous query functionality, uh, you'd use uh, you know Geode on the on the querying side of, of the CQRS pattern. Um, what we have also seen is you know uh, for applications that need to be deployed across uh, various geographies in an active active manner, uh, Geode can do that too. So. Um, uh, here again, a, uh, a typical example would be, you know, a trading firm which has operations in London, Tokyo, and New York, and uh, which wants to uh, use the local cluster to do uh, their trading locally, but also replicate that data over to the other sites um, so that they can reconcile and uh, and do their business processing. So you've got a bacon delivery service, and you need to notify your customers when their bacon has arrived at their doorstep. Twilio helps you make sure your customers get the bacon while it's hot. Twilio's programmable API lets you build SMS or voice alerts easily in the programming language of your choice, all in under five minutes with only a few lines of code. Now your customers get a text or a call the instant their bacon is ready. If your customers want to see the bacon frying on a hot pan, Twilio has video APIs and SDKs for the platforms that you know and love. Learn more at go.twilio.com slash podcast and get an additional $10 when you sign up and upgrade your account. That's go.twilio.com slash podcast. You will only pay for what you use and it costs less than a penny to send a text. Get started at go.twilio.com slash podcast. Get your bacon delivery service cooking with Twilio's APIs for voice, SMS, and video. Well, let's start to talk about the internals. Geode runs in the JVM, like we mentioned. It's a um, abstraction that... Uh, it has the, it implements the interface for a map, the Java map. Um, so the abstractions that we should talk about are the cache and the region. So describe so describe what a cache is in Geo. That's that is a data structure in Geo, and then there's a region. Describe what these terms mean. Uh, so should I really give a preview of the kinds of um... Uh, server-side components that you want to set up first uh, have running before you uh, access them through a client? Sure, that sounds good. Yeah, sure. Okay, so 
in uh, in geode uh, we have this uh, member type you know called a locator so essentially you, uh, which is a discovery service right so the sole purpose of the locator is for uh, geode servers to find one another and for geode clients to be uh, to find the servers and there is also this use case where so you can uh, have a geode deployment across a van site so you can have a remote site essentially not a disaster recovery site but you know an active active site I, I think, and we can that would need a totally different discussion but um, um, so the locator is the discovery piece um, so you bring up one or more locators and then you bring up any number of servers that you want and then you just point the server to the locator and then the servers discover one another and those servers you know um, are in the API, uh, we say that they are cache essentially, and the reason for that is uh, when 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 uh, development started on Geo, there was this uh, JSR uh, called JSR 107 for caching, uh, Jcash, and that JSR used the term cache and it used the term region uh, for the uh, for the map. Uh, Im implementation essentially and that's the reason why we use those terms um, even even today in our API um, although the JSR itself has uh, no longer uses the term region and but then you know um, we, we kind of uh, have not followed that JSR anymore because we do much more than what that JSR was meant to do uh, but we're still stuck with those terms. <laughs> so okay. um, when you say a cache in Geode, it roughly means a Geode server running, and that's it. And and a region in Geode is uh, is a hash map, There's a, a concurrent hash map, and and that's all there is to it actually. Right. Okay. So you've got a cat. The the abstraction of a quote cache is equivalent to the idea of a node, and the idea of a region is a hash map and you've got so what's the replication model there so my understanding is like you would make you would instantiate a region which is basically just a hash map and that region would get replicated across some number of caches is that right so um, there are two kinds of regions that you can create actually so you can choose um, that your region uh, is a replicated region which means um, each member in the cluster uh, gets the same set of information, gets the same data, right? It is completely a true copy on all the nodes. And uh, and then you can uh, also choose to partition the data, which, you know, which then ends up distributing the data across a number of nodes. And, and that is the more scalable solution. So... Um, yeah, those are the two kinds of regions, uh, two primarily two kinds of regions that you, know, you can configure. Certainly. So if you make a small, like if you just make a small hash map in, or a small region, I should say, region is equivalent to hash map. You make a small region, you would just replicate it. But if that region got really big, you would want to partition it, and then you replicate the partitions. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So Geode, as we've said, implements the map interface for java and i think the three operations are put get and remove maybe uh, i'm not sure if there's other ones um, yeah primarily there are you know so the uh, java uh, concurrent hash map has this atomic uh, operations so you can do this put if absent uh, oh, yeah. and uh, you know and even for remove you can pass in an old value and then and a new value so it only works if um, the value currently uh, in the region matches what you uh, what you pass in essentially to that to oh, that okay. to that remove call, and then it does that uh, operation atomically. So, what happens for these basic operations like put, get, and remove? Because anybody who's worked with distributed systems knows that there's all kinds of race conditions and things that you need to to worry about. Maybe you could walk us through these different operations. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so you know, a put, right? So when you essentially put a key and a value uh, from a client, um, the the client is connected to one of the servers, 
or it could be connected to more than one of the servers you know um, depending upon your use case but typically you would you it would it is connected to a few number of of servers so so that put request ends up on the server um, the server then uh, hashes the key and determines which uh, node uh, this or which bucket essentially um, that uh, that key belongs to and then it, it also knows which node in the distributed system is hosting that bucket and so it just sends the the put across to that to that member right and um, and and so the good thing about geo is uh, uh, we strongly uh, prefer to be a consistent system so you know so if you have configured say two redundant copies for your for your data uh, we make sure that the primary copy and the two redundant copies have the data before returning an acknowledgement back to the user saying that the put has completed and um, so you know uh, and, and and that's the reason why well uh, if you uh, from the same thread if you would then would, would to turn around and do a get no matter uh, if you go to the primary copy or to the secondary copy you're you're bound to get the correct answer so what about a remove operation? Um, so, well, removed uh, would work. I guess it's basically the same as a, as a put, kind of. Yeah. So it would okay. first go to the primary copy and then, you know, uh, and, and, and then to the secondaries. Now, is it tunably consistent or is it just absolutely consistent? Um, so, well, for a replicated region, you can choose to do asynchronous uh, sends over to the other member. Uh, for partition region... Well, we just we, we don't allow that, and um, uh, and and the reason is we don't want uh, people to shoot themselves in the foot, right? So uh, we understand that uh, you know cap theorem is difficult and it is difficult to get your head around uh, the whole availability scenario. So we uh, we try uh, to to really ensure that the data and and so you know even even in even in um, so. If, if you allow asynchronous replication to uh, remote copies, uh, what could happen is even if there is no network partition detection, um, if you turn around and if the same thread does a get, and this time around if we say, well, you know, let's do a read from the secondary bucket, uh, the thread may not see what it just put, which kind of seems wrong. <laughs> um, so for a partition region, that's not allowed. Um, but you know we should also talk about uh, uh, the whole cap theorem in in detail, I guess. Um, yeah, sure. Let's do that because I actually I think that's that's something that um, you can't emphasize enough. Like you can't do enough shows where you mention cap theorem and you discuss what it is. And yeah, why don't you just describe what cap theorem is? Because I f I feel like there probably are a lot of listeners who who don't know what cap theorem is. Sure. Okay. So um, so, so cap theorem. Um, essentially states that uh, C uh, is consistency, uh, A is availability, and P is partition tolerance. And um, the theorem essentially says that, you know, you, you can only get two of those three things, which means, and to, to put it in simpler terms, so uh, if there is a network partition in, in your system, then you can choose to get an uh, you know either an available system or a partition uh, or a or a consistent system, but not both. And you can never give up partition tolerance, basically, because you're generally on some kind of cloud provider, and there are network partitions all the time. Right. Um, so the uh, you know um, one of the uh, so you know we we the earlier examples spoke about what could happen without a partition tolerance. Um, you know, one thread doing a read and seeing inconsistent data. Um, it is interesting that, you know, the, the way we handle network partition itself uh, is kind of interesting because there are systems that need to be consistent and there are other systems that need to be available. And um, so e Eric Brewer, right, the the person, the, uh, the uh, uh, Eric Brewer who actually came up with CAP theorem also says, well, uh, ATMs don't are not really uh, uh, consistent all all the time. So you would imagine that ATM always has to be because it's dealing with money and um, you know all the good stuff trying to withdraw money, and that you would expect that to be consistent at all times. 
but he says that's not really the case it's you know it it tends to be available uh, over consistent and so uh, what we do in geode is we allow users to pick uh, what they want essentially so you know from from a uh, network partition perspective you can tune your geode system to either be consistent uh, or to be available yeah it's interesting how different applications make that decision um the interviews i've done about uber uber generally values availability over consistency because they don't want somebody to not be able to request a ride because the database is locking to make sure that you know transactions are correct or to make sure that they're getting the optimal route you know they just want they want the system to always be available and so they build systems like ring pop which is kind of this um you know, it has a, um, I think like a Bayou type of gossip protocol, which is, I guess, less consistent, um, but it's highly available. And, um, but, you know, not to get too uh, deep in the weeds on, on that one, the, the uh, but a relation I do think of between um, the, that ring pop system that I did some shows on, the Uber ring pop system and Geode is the idea of, connecting over a peer-to-peer network so the different nodes in the geode distributed system these different caches well i mean cache is the term for node these nodes connect to each other over a peer-to-peer network so what's going on with this peer-to-peer network um like you know when i do a put to like let's say i have a big let's say i have a uh you know 30 30 node geode cluster and I've got a bunch of um, partitioned, replicated hash maps across that 30-node cluster, and I do a put operation to one of my hash maps, and it gets written to um, it gets written to two nodes before I can um, access that data. So it's so it's got cloned across two nodes, but. How does it get propagated to other nodes? Because, uh, as I understand, it gets replicated beyond just those two nodes. Um, how does that peer-to-peer network um, perform the, the more, the more, uh, the bigger replication? Um, yeah. Well. Um, or correct me what I'm wrong about. <laughs> so you know, uh, it actually within the same cluster. Um, so so the idea behind having uh, the peer-to-peer network in in the first place is uh, you can have uh, geo uh, clients you know talking to the servers and if you want to have um, a large number of clients right uh, and you you can do that so you can you can say rather than having your client connect to each server to uh, to you know to to get it, get its data right so if if you um, were implementing this uh, consistent hashing uh, algorithm. So what typically ends up happening is then the client ends up doing the hashing. And then the client decides uh, which server it needs to go to to fetch that data. And well, um, establishing, so you know, you, you, could, you could choose to leave the connection from uh, all the clients, uh, you know, um, you can choose all the clients to be connected to all the servers at all times but if you have a large number of clients that becomes unscalable quickly right and so uh, uh, what the peer-to-peer system allows us is to have a large number of clients even you know and we have clients in the tens of thousands actually connecting to a geo uh, cluster uh, and if a client is then connecting to maybe only one server, then that server will then be able to get the um, the data that the client requested or put the data that the client requested within one hop. If 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 the client uh, if the if the server doesn't really have the data, so the flow would be the client does a get request. That get request comes to the server that the client is connected to. And then the server is then at, from that point on only one hop away from uh, being able to get uh, the data that the the client requested. 
so that's one reason for having the peer to peer system um the other reason is um you can actually embed the geo servers within your application itself and uh so at that point you know you are forming this um uh, peer to peer system of your application itself and you know and and at that point your application then also is like only one hop away from getting the data that it needs essentially so um you can and and so you can do those two kinds of topologies i guess with uh, with geo okay L- let's talk about what geo might be replacing in certain contexts so um i haven't done any shows about memcache or redis but uh, as i understand geode could potentially replace these in certain applications because geode or because memcache and redis i think can be used as this type of distributed um object store or maybe that maybe that's accurate or maybe you could tell me what technologies geode might be replacing in certain applications yeah sure so um the the common use case that uh, we have uh, seen for for geode is actually the applications um you know um choosing to use geode as the store of record so we basically hide the database from the application right so the application is only talking to geode and oh. and and then geode has this uh, notion of um, a queue that it builds up of all the operation that happen in geo and then uh, as a bulk update you push those to the relational database oh and okay. and uh, we also have this then uh, a loader mechanism so for example then if a, if a get comes in from the application and geo doesn't host the data then um, we have this pluggable implementation where you know you could go back to the database fetch the, uh, your uh, your your object from the database and then put it in geo and that becomes available for geo from that point onwards hmm. and you can and and then then you can do you know um, least recently used eviction time to live expiration and all the good stuff continuous integration gives you faster safer software delivery with a continuous integration tool like Snap CI from ThoughtWorks, the members of your team can push changes independently of each other, and they can all see their new builds running against different phases of tests before those changes make their way into production. The fastest moving companies that I've talked to on Software Engineering Daily are all using continuous integration. Snap CI from ThoughtWorks is available to anyone. And if you go to snap.ci slash software engineering daily, you can check it out for yourself and support software engineering daily. With just a few clicks, I had my own continuous integration set up for some projects that were just sitting in my GitHub account without continuous integration. I got continuous integration up quite easily using Snap CI. If you want to be that hero at your company that starts moving your organization towards deploying often, more confidently, uh, towards that DevOps dream, start working with Snap CI at snap.ci slash software engineering daily. Your coworkers will see you working with Snap CI and they will fall in love with it themselves. Oftentimes it takes somebody at a bigger company to go out on their own and say, okay, I'm going to roll out CI even though nobody else at the company is using it. And maybe that hero at the company is going to be you so check out snap.ci slash software engineering daily and thanks to thoughtworks for being a continued sponsor of software engineering daily it really means a lot so you just use you basically use geode as your database of record and um it's really big so you rarely have a cache miss but in the event that you do you can go to the database that's backing geode that's on disk and you can um you can just uh access it access whatever you you cache missed from the database and then lru it into geode yep absolutely and um so you know and 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 on the point of uh, redis and and memcached right so um 
Uh, so Memcached is a, is a very popular cache, and and so is Redis. And Redis is actually more than just you know just a cache, just just a key value store, right? So Redis offers this uh, uh, rich data structures like a, a list and a and a sorted set, um, and um, and it's very very fast. So you now what what we ended up doing in in Geo is uh, essentially we build these uh, protocol adapters so uh, when you start up a geo server you can say you know um, yeah i'll listen to geo clients on this port and i'll listen to memcached clients on these other port and i will listen for redis clients on you know yet this another port and so from that point onwards you can have all those three uh, clients talk to a single geo server right and 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 um, the the goal here is to make uh, the operational life easier so rather than having three different technologies deployed in the back end you can just do make do with one um just deploy geo server and you know you get all three absolutely um so how does a geo deployment change as the load scales cuz you know, if we're talking about a big financial application, um, over time, probably there's or the, or a social network. Like, there's going to be more users. There's going to be more load on the servers. The servers are going to have to change their topology. They're going to have to grow in number to support that. How does a geo deployment change as that load scales? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, in in geo, um, you know the the distributed system itself is very flexible so um, you know it, it's it is elastic right? you can scale it up and down no problems um, so as soon as you bring in a new so you know if if if, if say you are uh, running uh, you know really low on resources right uh, so you're uh, running full of, you, you're running out of memory essentially on your geode cluster you just add uh, new instances to the geode cluster and again adding instances is simply uh, pointing the instance to the locator and that's it so once the instance uh, connects to the locator the locator says here are all the other uh, geode servers i know about and then the new member then connects to all those members um, the the additional thing that the locator also does is it, it tells the new member saying you know here is the definition of all the regions that I know that are in the cluster so um, go ahead and create those um, the new member then creates those regions and um, so uh, after it has created regions it you know asks um, the existing members for part of the data right so for some buckets if, if you um, if, if you have a partition region it says send me a few buckets um, and if you have a replicated region then obviously it gets the whole thing uh, and so you know while it is getting data um, that member itself is still available for doing all the operations so you know um, consider that uh, you are embedding the geo server within your application itself um, so that member is instantly able to then from that point onwards do uh, puts and gets and everything even though it is still trying to uh, gather this data from uh, and, and initialize itself from from the other members and we have this cool algorithm called state flush which you know make sure that no in-flight operations are missed um, and the state of the cl cluster is consistent. Um, so, you know, given that, you know, as soon as you spin up a, so I'm, <laughs> I guess what I was trying to get at is, as soon as you try to spin a cluster up, within a few seconds, that that member is then able to do operations and is a you know a active member in in the cluster. That that sounds pretty useful. Um, so. Um geode it only runs on the jvm um why is that why is java so useful for um for this kind of application or or um you know are you thinking about having apis for 
um, other languages are, I don't know, just talk, talk a little bit about the choice of Java. Yeah, um, well, so this was, uh, again, you know, um, the, the project started way back in the day. And um, um, I so honestly, I don't really know why they ended up choosing Java over uh uh, well, f- those financial companies, they, they do tend to use like either Java or C++ for like their the bulk of their code base. Mm-hmm, that is true. So, well, you know, it is interesting. So, you know, um, we do have C++ clients, actually. So oh. we have this, uh, uh, even though the server runs Java, uh, mm-hmm. we have a, a client that is C++ and, you, you, and it does, you know, exactly the same number of things that the Java client does. I mean, are there some, are there some benefits that you get out of the robust garbage collection of the JVM? Haha. <laughs> so uh, for the longest time we did, uh, so the JVM is really good at, we are a cache, right? So we store objects. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so we definitely benefit uh, or benefited from uh, from the JVM's garbage collection. Um, however, you know, as uh, the JVM size uh, keep increasing so earlier if, if you had maybe a few gigabytes uh, of, of uh, RAM uh, or um, RAM provision for the geo uh, server the JVM heap wasn't really a big problem right but as soon as you have uh, anything north of say 50 50 gigs uh, on on one uh, server so 50 gigs of heap you start to run into uh, what the JVM community calls these uh, stop the world garbage collection pauses. Ah, yes. Right? Um, so, yeah, those tend to be a problem. And and nowadays, we've actually seen, um, you know, a few users using more than uh, 100 gigs per, per instance. So... The problem gets even worse there, right? So it's a it's a tuning exercise from from that point onwards. And um, JVM tuning is uh, I think more a art than a science. Um, so it's it's it tends to be difficult. It tends to be uh, uh, you know time consuming as well. So uh, for the one one o release, what we actually ended up doing is. Uh, we built this uh, memory manager. So we, you know, we say provision a small, small Java heap uh, on on your large uh, server class machine, and let us manage the rest of the RAM for you. So we provision this off heap memory, and we ended up building this uh, off heap memory manager, and uh, um, so you know if if that whole memory is hidden from um, the garbage collector, then there is no stop the world pause. Uh, our throughput actually is significantly better, um, you know, by using that off heap off heap memory. And um, yeah, and so you know, and the thing is, we are a cache, but you know, we are only storing objects, right? So we're not storing complicated uh, object graphs that the JVM has to deal with, and and that's the uh, the bane of the problem, I guess, you know, trying to determine which uh, objects are live and which can be garbage collected. And that's the whole reason why JVM ends up with these stop the world pauses. Yes. Um, but, you know, for a cache, it is fairly simple to determine what is garbage and what isn't. So we said, you know, why not, why not uh, do it ourselves? And we have this garbage, uh, garbage collector or memory manager for off heap memory. Very interesting. I yeah, I worked at a finance place briefly out of college, and they spent a lot of time tuning the JVM um, because of the exact reasons that you're describing. Um, so let's talk more about the the interaction between the cache and the database that is backing Geode, or that that Geode will write to if it's um, if it's I guess if it's, uh, or, or I guess you have this write-ahead log that connects Geode and the underlying database that's writing to disk. Um, how often should you expect to have a cache miss? I mean, um, you know, and when I think of the financial institution example, maybe you've got like a bunch of stocks that you trade a lot. And so in Geode, you keep, you know, you want to keep information in Geode, in the Geode cache about Netflix and Google and Amazon and these high volatility stocks that you're trading a lot. But maybe 
the company decides, okay, occasionally we're going to trade um, Procter and Gamble, and then when you when you need to trade that, maybe you need to um, go to you need to go beyond the cash and go into disk. Um, I don't know how do, how do you tune that? How do you decide how aggressively you're going to evict stuff and how aggressively you're going to need to go or how often you're going to need to go to disk? Yeah, um, right. So um, a couple of things that I I can I can uh, talk about I guess in this in this case. So you know um, uh, you can definitely go out to in case of a cache mess you can definitely go out to the database and and get that uh, entry back. Um, um, but what Geode also does is it allows you to overflow values onto the local disk itself, right? So without having to go out to the uh, to the database. I guess I should talk about the um, the models, the uh, eviction models also. Um, um, so uh, you you can have um, a time to live when you put something into into Geode. You can say you know. Um, clean it up after after these many seconds um, you can also say for each of the regions um, only have uh, x amount of memory so you know for example if this region exceeds say a gigabyte then uh, evict uh, the least recently used entry right so make sure that it this region always stays stays at a gigabyte um, you can do that on a region by region le- uh, basis, you know, uh, and so there might be some regions that you might want to give more memory for, and some less important regions um, that you want to give less memory for, right? Um, and it depends upon your application. Um, the um, the other thing, you know, if uh, you can do is so if you, if you don't know uh, upfront how much memory to give to each of the regions. You can uh, configure a, a resource manager. So, um, and on, on the resource manager, you say um, when the when the heap, the JVM heap reaches say eighty percent, start evicting the least recently used entry. And um, and and you know and and that's the way to to get eviction out. And so with all these evictions, you can have two sorts of eviction actions. So you can say. Uh, while doing eviction, get rid of this entry altogether. So the key value pair, get get rid of it. Or you can say, overflow the value onto disk. Mm. And when that, so, you know, um, when that value is overflowed to disk, the, the good thing is we still have the key in memory. And um, the way, so, so, you know, in addition to be, um, only memory centric you also has this persistence layer right so we have this write ahead log and we maintain files on on the local disks and and and, and whatnot and um the the one uh, good thing that we do is we have these offsets of where that value is on the disk uh, you know uh, and that lives together with the key in memory so you are never one, more than one disk seek away from the value that you want uh, which is you know which is pretty cool so you don't have we don't have to scan or you know do anything of that sort you say over for the values the keys is always in memory we know the offset and we'll, we'll get the uh, the key to you within 10 milliseconds right that, that's what the disk uh, um, seek time tends to be on average okay so i have a question about hadoop do people use geode as a data store for sp- like speeding up their hadoop queries or uh, for usage with spark or other distributed frameworks um we've not seen geode used as a accelerator for hadoop what uh, we have definitely seen is um you know so um, the data from Geo instead of sending that to a backend database, we've seen people send that to HDFS instead, and then uh, you know run their analytical jobs on on H- on on Hadoop essentially. Mm-hmm. But we've not seen Geo being used as a, a, a Hadoop accelerator. Okay. Essentially, but you know I don't see a reason why it couldn't be. Um, you know again we're 
we're Apache, right? We're uh, out in the open. So if uh, if somebody wants to say, uh, here is a big file, I'll break it up between chunks and then store those chunks as, as key value pairs in Geode, then then Geode can definitely be used as a, as a Hadoop accelerator as well. Now I saw some benchmarks of Geode against Cassandra in a slide share. Um, and I know we talked about Geode versus something like Redis or Memcache, but how does Geode compare to Cassandra? Do they ser- and do they serve similar purposes in in other deployments? I think so. Um, so you know, so as far as uh, uh, the object modeling, I guess, um, and you know, the the use case of, uh, of having a massive scale is concerned. Um, yeah, I think Geode and Cassandra. Um, could be compared, and uh, we've I think we've also seen them, I guess, in uh, you know in, in customer engagement. So, but well, uh, and when I say customer engagements, those are only for Gemfire, which is based on Geode and, and not Geode itself. Um, uh, but you know, my take on that is uh, Cassandra tends to be uh, disk oriented, so it you know it uses a disk a whole lot more, and it uh, really relies on the disk, uh, whereas Geo, you know, is, is mainly memory oriented, and it it does use the disk, but it is mainly ma- memory oriented, uh, yeah. suitable for uh, quick, rapid lookups and you know, online transaction processing applications. As we begin to wrap up. What is the story behind Geode making its way from the closed source? The financial world to the open source Apache Foundation. Yeah, so uh, um, so you know we knew that we had this uh, very cool project, right? And and we we've, uh, we've actually seen the rise of uh, many NoSQL data stores. And all the while thinking to ourselves, well, you know, we do that. We do that, <laughs> right? But those were just, you know, um, um, so I'm, I'm talking on behalf of uh, my my developer friends here. Um, but I guess what the uh, the higher-ups and the management ended up seeing is um, uh, more and more um, customers are um, saying that, you know, well, is your product open source? And if it's not, then they don't even... Uh, you know, uh, allow you to run POCs essentially. So um, that was, I think, the impetus on uh, really getting this thing fired up. And well, and uh, you know, us developers have been trying to push and get this thing open source also for a for a long time. Um, so uh, it's it's only for the good that this thing ended up happening finally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's good to see it. So you work at Pivotal. Why is Pivotal interested in Geode? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So, uh, so, so Pivotal, you know, um, I think many people might. Um, so, uh, just to give a, a big picture of what the company does, right? So, it has three arms. So, one is Cloud Foundry that uh, I think most of the people are familiar with. Um, the second is the the big data suite uh, and the data org and um, so you know, um, in big data suite, we have Gemfire, which is for online transaction processing and in memory and 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 Geo essentially, you know, uh, which is the core of of Gemfire. Um, and then we have uh, this massive, massively parallel uh, uh, analytical database called GreenPlum. And, um, you know, uh, and we also have this uh, connector, you know, which enables uh, the applications, the the fast side, essentially, uh, Gemfire, Geo, to talk to Greenplum. And uh, what that enables to give our customers is this, uh, 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 is this uh, analytical, uh, this feedback loop, right? Um, the analytical loop that uh, is commonly also referred to as the Lambda architecture. Um, so, uh, that's, I guess that that's what we are trying to provide to our customers. And oh, that's the okay. reason why Pivotal is, is interested. It sounds like a very specialized version of the Lambda architecture. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, um, 
Swapnil, I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and um, I was really happy to learn about Geode. So if um, you know if anybody out there listening has ideas for shows, as always, send them to me. And um, you know, if you are the best person to speak on the topic, then you know, in this case, that was absolutely the case. Um, you know, Swapnil, you were uh, a great evangelist for geode and um i feel i feel like i understand the project to a pretty good extent and I, I think the listeners will feel that way as well great thanks a lot for having this thanks to symphono for sponsoring software engineering daily symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other Check it out at symphono.com slash sedaily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash sedaily. Thanks again, Symphono. Wow.